Thank you, uh, Dr. Blackwell. Let me say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, but certainly never good night, and never ever goodbye, because I had too much trauma with that goodbye as a child. So I say hello, and how are you? My name is the Reverend Nathaniel Wayne Martin, and I am the pastor of the New Life Institutional Baptist Church here in the city of Los Angeles. We are located at 8916 South Main in the city of Los Angeles, and uh, we have been constantly, consistently uh, a church, a corporation, whatever you call it, well, as a corporation and as a church, uh, since July of 1952. I looked on Yelp, and they said we didn't exist, but uh, of course, I can't get all my efforts information from Yelp. So we are worshiping with our sister church, the Shiloh Missionary Christian Church, pastored by my good friend, the Reverend Dr. Della F. Holland. And uh, we have two congregations in one church, one law, one faith, and one baptism. Uh, one God and Father of all, who is above all, over all, and through all, and in you all. And uh, one hope and faith of your, our, our calling. And I, I trust in the word of God. And as I say, I believe God that he will do as he has uh, promised. If we will show ourselves uh, faithful. The offering that you are viewing uh, takes more of a social justice uh, turn. Uh, obviously, we take all our, our marching orders from the scriptures, from the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the uh, epistles as far as they go and the letters of the uh, New Testament writers. Uh, this, since we began uh, this uh, broadcast, I think we started in 2017 in December. Could be wrong. Uh, we have been talking about uh, the disparities and why things are as things are uh, across the nation. And uh, we're getting away from the nature or nurture thing. No, no, it's so, it, sociologists have taught us sociology and that sociology has a tremendous impact on our on our existence, on uh, where we were born, when we were born, uh, how we grow, how we live, how we get educated, uh, <clears throat> our nutrition, our food, and of course our education, which is vital. Uh, the schools we are compelled to attend, uh, for the most part in uh, this country, uh, and the like, and uh, where you work, and where you rear your family and the opportunities that will be available unto you have a large, have a huge, excuse me, there's a huge sociological component. Uh, those who have uh, uh, developed the Africana Studies uh, program, of which I am an adherent and a strong supporter and believer, uh, 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 have taught. Uh, that the environment represents more or less the social structure, uh, whether it was uh, pr approximate, in other words, close in, or uh, distal, meaning that it is far off, it still has its Im impact, its influence, and its effect uh, upon you and upon me. And uh, we overlook it at our, our peril. And so uh, this sense uh 2017, we have had to uh, uh, develop ourselves. We've had to, I guess, convince ourselves that this housing thing is a critical component to all that is going to happen to you uh, in the rest of your life. Where are you living? What are your living conditions? And uh, in studying scripture, you see, God is work is always dealing with housing. First, play, first family had a house, had somewhere to live, 
Uh, and when they came out of the, the Garden of Eden, uh, God provided them still with uh, somewhere to live uh, and the like. And when God destroyed, before God destroyed the earth, he provided Noah with somewhere to live and uh, somewhere for uh, nature to, to survive, to be housed. So God is definitely concerned with housing. And uh, you can go all through the uh, uh, history in the scriptures there. You can find all manner of references. But when you look at it, housing is a principal uh, component of, uh, for the, the uh, alleviation or for the existence of uh, life uh, here on earth and when Jesus began to, to talk to the disciples about heaven he made sure he uh, met, told them that there was going to be sufficient housing uh, in heaven in my father's house uh, there's plenty of mansions plenty of housing there I go to prepare in other words there's not going to be any lack uh, of housing when we uh, quit this mortal coil as we as the poets uh, want to say. Uh, having said all of that, of course, uh, that is our uh, look that we're taking uh, today. I was looking at the 101 freeway and the 10 freeway, and then, uh, of course, I was a little boy. I was born in a little town called Houston, Texas, and we lived out in a little suburb at that time. It wasn't a suburb, it was just where they let the Negroes live. <laughs> <laughs> he called it Central Garden. But uh, my auntie and uh, her family were being, in other words, with her husband, uh, my uncle O'Connor, and my auntie Alberta, they lived on a little street called Orange in uh, over there in Fifth Ward. Watch this now. And so, you know, being colored, you're trying to have a house and everything trying to get your family established and then the uh uh city of houston decided to put that 59 freeway through there and they just wiped out all of orange and all that area where my uh auntie had raised uh was raising her family was trying to raise a kid and so they had to relocate uh to to trinity god and uh and you say, well, they went to the Trinity Garden, but the point is, look what they lost, you know. And uh, you were uprooted and uh, come to find out that uh, once President Eisenhower uh, signed the highway uh, projects program to build the interstates all across the nation, uh, they said they were building them <clears throat> to uh, connect all the cities. But you come to find out that many of the city planners and the city fathers were using uh, these uh, highway, highways and freeway proposals as an opportunity to eliminate what they call uh, black town. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> eliminate, because all the, the freeways, for the most part, ran right straight through the middle, the, the basic portion of where the... Uh, Colored people, the Negroes, as we were called at that time. Uh, uh, shout out to those of you who who who, uh, have, who who can only respond to black. I can I can dig that. I can understand that, and I, that's what I respond to. But I'm going by what the uh, the uh, period of which I'm speaking, uh, how we were referred to. In fact, we were referred to far more derisively than Negro. Uh, and uh, what happened was the uh, freeways and the highways eliminated a lot of valuable uh, property that was owned by, by <coughs> blacks, colored people, Negroes, all across the African Americans, all across this nation as a result of the, uh, what they call uh, urban renewal and and uh, when the people would protest, then of course the city planners would say, well, that's why the land is the cheapest. And the reason why the land was the cheapest, because why? That's the only place Negroes were allowed to live. And by that, Negroes being uh, uh, compelled to live in those type of conditions, uh, circumstances, and area, 
uh, even if they developed that area, it was still regarded uh, downtown City Hall as an uh, urban blight and uh, slums. Uh, case in point, uh, leaving Houston, come back out here uh, in uh, Los Angeles uh, when they were put in the East West uh, 10 freeway through. Well, uh, Hattie McDaniels and Charles Houston and a lot of affluent uh, uh, Negroes lived in what they call Sugar Hill. And it was, I'd say, it was affluent. It looked real good. Had it, McDaniel uh, <clears throat> was well known, had won an Oscar and all of that type of Gone with the Wind. It was everybody in the area and, and uh, had owned their own house. It was houses, what, six and seven bedrooms, all of that, upstairs, downstairs. Those folks had big, huge mansions over in that area. Well, uh, the, the city father decided, well, uh, we want to uh, we want to get rid of that area. And uh, but uh, Hattie McDaniel's and her, her group, Mr. H along with Mr. Houston and others, they went down and protested, and was able to forestall the uh, city council of Los Angeles from. Uh, getting rid of that uh, area. And lo and behold, in the 50s, here comes the freeway. <laughs> Lord help me. The 10 freeway and what uh, the city council had uh, been unable to do when uh, the uh, first uh, thought of uh, getting rid of, of uh, Sugar Hill came about. Well, now the, the federal government came uh, with its uh, uh, highway money and completely uh, bulldoze all of that valuable affluent area as a blighted slum area. Well, there was nothing blighted about Sugar Hill. Uh, but again, that was the, the thrust, uh, that was the uh, philosophy, uh, that was the attitude of the entire nation toward uh, the Negro. The Negro was dispensable or expendable at least. Uh, in any case, uh, what uh, Negroes had did not matter. The uh, Civil War notwithstanding, the Taney Edict was still uh, in force and uh, being taught tacitly. And so uh, a lot of our people lost a lot of valuable land uh, and were not, at that time when they were not, of course, uh, compensated because uh, you lived in a Negro community, your property was below market value in the first place. And of course, now you got to, they're going to give you what they want, they being the eminent domain of the city, the county, the state, or the federal, they're going to give you only what they're going to give you, and you have got to go and now find you another place with that money, which means you can only go to another place, another geographical location where with that kind of money, where you can find something that you can buy like that. And uh, that... Uh, he, he eliminates a lot of history and a lot of culture and uh, the the uh, blacks and the uh, uh, so-called Hispanics have been the hardest uh, hit and the uh, hardest affected. They, they uh, estimated over 10,000 families in the uh, California area, well in the Los Angeles area, have been displaced because of these uh, freeway expansion, these highway uh, expansions, and they don't just, they didn't just affect that generation. Now, they're saying that the 101 expansion is going to take away a lot of valuable homes that are owned by uh, our Mexican uh, brothers and sisters who were already hurt in the original, mind you, when those uh, uh, freeways were built. And uh, we know it affects the poor the hardest because the poor have the least impact in uh, Sacramento. For instance, when they were going to build a freeway through Beverly Hill, uh-uh, why? That's where the money's at. Those people went up to, uh, to uh, Sacramento, no freeway through their neighborhood. Uh, in the meantime, Sugar Hill's wiped out. Uh, the 105 freeway was being planned. All of that valuable area through Athens Way and all like that wiped out. Uh, the people uh, had to move. And uh, show you what happened when you got 
impact when you got uh, money and when you're white. When that freeway came up, the 710 freeway came up from Long Beach and got up there uh, by Valley Boulevard and we're going to go through South Pasadena, it stopped. And it ain't got through South Pasadena yet. Uh, it still stops at Valley Boulevard at the end of the 710 freeway. It ain't never connected with the 210. Uh, and it ain't gonna connect with the 210 freeway up there uh, in Pasadena because that's that Pasadena uh, Chamber of Commerce. That's where that's old money, rich money, great political power there, and of course they're able to just tell the people you don't you don't need no no freeway coming through our uh, valuable valuable areas, and so it's a different. Uh, is what I'm saying. So you can see the value uh, that housing and the impact uh, that housing have played. Uh, somebody wrote a book called Our History is in Our Houses, is in Our Homes. Well, that it is, we just don't realize it. Uh, uh, how our, where we lived has been affected by the uh, sociological impact of our uh, social structure uh, in which we are compelled uh, to live. Uh, which brings us to again to Ephesians chapter 6 uh, verse 11 and 12 uh, where Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood hmm? yeah he tells us in verse 11 to put on hold arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles uh, of the devil for you wrestle not against flesh and blood uh, but against principalities against powers against, excuse me against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness uh, in high places, and these uh, construction companies, these these uh, these uh, major corporations, uh, these huge organizations worldwide and international and uh, national as well, they have great uh, influence on our communities and on our neighborhoods where we live. Uh, where we work, where we worship, where we shop, where we play, and where we pray. And uh, for the most part of uh, the uh, previous centuries, uh, it was such a segregated world that uh, you were born segregated, and when you died, you died uh, segregated. And were buried in a segregated uh, uh, cemetery. From the womb to the tomb, you were segregated here in the land of the free and the home of the brave, the land of, of liberty. And uh, we always say it was the land of uh, the uh, free, land of the free and home of the brave, free, free white folks and the, courage, and the brave black folk. And uh, for the most part, that's the way that uh, it has uh, maintained and uh, has continued. Uh, and going back to my hometown, for which I was born, as I said, in Houston, I see where Independence Heights is again uh, under threat that the uh, highway uh, committee, highway project, is going to wipe out more of, uh, of uh, Independence Heights. Notice that it uh, says here that uh, it's the Clayton Homes and Kelly Village. Uh, public housing are in danger of being uh, wiped out, of losing a lot of uh, valuable property. And uh, I remember when the 610 freeway came through there, I thought it was a great thing, but I didn't know it had wiped out so many of our people's property and housing, you know, right there in, in Houston. In other words, there's no uh, equality, there's no equity, uh, but that... Uh, the Negroes uh, portion, the Negro uh, residences, the Negro uh, 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 areas, uh, living areas where we live are on a constant threat. And that's even if you have struggled to buy and purchase and pay uh, and maintain that house. Uh, there's a lady right there in Houston who, who has uh, purchased a place, uh, Modesti Cooper, and is in danger of losing it. Going to take that house a property for that freeway uh, on ramps and all of that type of expansion uh, and we got to pray for that sister and, and stand with that sister that uh, 
uh, you might be able to prevail against the uh, the power that be. Thank God you have Joe Biden in the White House, but you're not going to have him up there always. And uh, uh, with this bill back better uh, funds that they want to release uh, to the states, uh, even with that, it has a, a, a condition that, you, that they just stop. It. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, the old practice of just uh, wiping out uh, the places where the uh, black people live. Let's be fair about it, okay? Now, as I get ready to wrap up, I want to talk a bit while we're still talking about these principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Remember, you're talking about uh, organizations and you're talking about corporations and uh, you're talking about companies and you're talking about authorities and people who have delegated authority and delegated power and you overlook them at your peril. Uh, and so uh, notice if you please that there is a uh, two cases going on, two big cases. The uh, McMichael case for the killing, the murder, the butchery of poor brother Ahmad Arbery by, uh, 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 what's his name, Gr uh, Travis McMichael and, and Greg McMichael. Now, uh, this, one of these McMichaels, the father, has a, he was a, is a retired policeman from Brunswick Police Department. And when the murder first occurred, the uh, district attorney, in Brunswick refused to even file uh, charges or have these fellas uh, arrested for the murder of Mr. Arbery. Uh, and because, and he would have got away with it, I'm sure, if it had not been that they began to boast and brag about him putting up these bits of, uh, of a video on Facebook. And they became a national uh, a viral sensation. And people began to say, well, you mean tell me you can commit a murder like that, and nobody, and the district attorney, and the city attorney, whatever, in Georgia, is not going to do anything about it. And so two of the uh, DA uh, attorneys general in two of the close-by uh, uh, municipalities, uh, Brunswick and the next one over, refused. And so uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation had to take over the case, and now the case has received, uh, as a result, nationwide attention. It happened back in February of 2020. And uh, uh, I think they're in day six of the trial uh, today. But, and in my uh, concern is that if you look at that trial, uh, you see how the, the, the social structure protects and puts a fence around its own. Now, those fellows were supposed to have been arrested the day that the murder occurred, but by Mr. McMichael himself having been a former policeman, just recently retired. And all of the policemen, you look on, on the, uh, the reason why we know it, because of the body cam footage, the uh, uh, great fraternity and deference that was shown to uh, the McMichaels. And this one McMichael has got blood, just all very blood over both of his hands. And uh, his hands were supposed to have been put in. Uh, the procedure would have been to uh, bag his hands, don't let him wash his hands until they get him downtown. But no, he wasn't even arrested that day. And uh, he was able to wash his hands. You, you hear the police, they can give him some water so they can wash the blood off his hands, all that type of stuff. All those are violations, you know. And then they allow the, the, the McMichaels to go in and out of the crime scene. You know? And again, they were not arrested that day. They were not arrested the next day. They were not even arrested that month. It was some weeks. Uh, uh, it happened in February. It was way down in May or June, if not, before they were finally uh, charged and arrested. And so you can see how the uh, social structure is still uh, very powerful and uh, very impactful, especially in a, a place like... Uh, uh, Georgia, which is a, a historic uh, uh, cradle and a historic uh, bastion 
uh, uh, fortress for uh, segregation and hatred against uh, black people. Okay, let me say principalities, power, the police structure, uh, the police power, the origin of the police structure was right there, and its purpose was, why it was, was to what? Uh, to police the bodies of, of black people. Uh, slavery from slavery on, from slavery on, and uh, you can look at the attitudes of the police personnel there, black or white makes no difference, and uh, you can see how they protect uh, their own, and they see that they they feel they're doing nothing wrong in letting these fellows get away all of those months without being charged for the murder of another human being. Why? Because they were white and the human being murdered was uh, vilified and his pathology was his skin color. And uh, contrast that uh, down there in the other case, I'm wrapping up, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, my prediction is they're going to get away with it. Uh, his youth, his his boyish looks, uh, the fact that he has the support of the white supremacist uh, infrastructure, the uh, 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 the AWE, that means the American uh, white evangelicals are supporting him. They raised $2 million for his bail to get him out and, uh, and the like. I feel that he's going to walk free. Uh, he's going to become a poster child, and that's who you're going to have to look out for uh, in the coming years. These young fellas with young white fellas with these AR-15, uh, full of hate uh, and cunning, and feeling that they can get away with murder because he's going to get away with this uh, uh, here in the United States of America. Uh, remember, he went down there to to protect a property, to protect public property. Uh, against what he called protesters, arsonists, and looters. And the protesters, arsonists, and looters were, for the most part, black. Uh, because the black folk was protesting the shooting of Jacob Blake. Uh, I think he was shot seven times in the back, paralyzed for life. Uh, thank God he survived. Uh, by the uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin uh, police officer. You can see it on YouTube it's, uh, from the beginning. It was... He just grabbed him by the back of his shirt and just pumped the guns into him. And his man kid was sitting in the seat, in the car seat, and all like that. It was terrible. And uh, they ain't charging with nothing, but they, kid, but they all, but they paralyzed him for life. I don't get that. But when you're black, that's what you have to contend with. As I wrap up, I stand by what I say. And I'm praying for my working brothers and my working sisters. Uh, look like we got a chance to have a good labor movement now. Uh, they call it the Great Resignation. Our labor brothers and sisters are saying, I'm going to take this job and shove it. And uh, they're walking off of these jobs. They're not coming back until they get the better working condition and better pay and all of that. That's good. That's good. That means labor is becoming valuable and important again as it has always been. Yes, I still believe in reparations. And uh, we're going to have to get reparations. But thank God for our labor brothers and sisters. And uh, like you said, as I always say, so I say now, one, and say unto all of you, if you're working for somebody and they don't want to pay you, don't work for them. Thank you, Doc. We out of here.